Why does my arm hurt from little leaguers to golden sneakers? This is a case-based approach. My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland. I'm a professor at the University of Kentucky, orthopedic surgeon. This was presented at the Sports Medicine Essentials course through American College of Sports Medicine, formerly the Team Physician course. This will be our menu. We'll start with the elbow, then go to shoulder, and then go to conclusions. There will be a time code to tell you where each of these will be in the presentation. The appearance and fusion of secondary ossification centers is very important in the skeletally immature, active patient or athlete. In females and males, there's a difference of about a couple of years of the appearance and fusion of these apophyses, secondary ossification centers about the elbow. This was from a chapter written in Dr. Andrews' book, Injuries in Baseball. And I would refer you to this chapter, which is also on my website, which is myname.com. If you're concerned about an elbow in a young skeletally mature athlete get a view of the other side and it makes it much better to compare to see if th something is missing or something doesn't look symmetric. So these are the appearances and fusion of the times in females on the left and males on the right. Think about a differential diagnosis of the elbow in different compartments medial, lateral, posterior, anterior. And the medial compartment is where it's all happening, so to speak. We can also think about acute injuries and chronic injuries. Acute injuries in the skeletally immature differential diagnosis is avulsion fracture of the medial humeral epicondyle, UCL sprain, which is rare in the young, young athlete, but is becoming increasingly more common in that almost skeletal mature athlete, although he's only 14-year-old pitcher. Ulnar nerve subluxation, hypermobility of the ulnar nerve occurs in about 20% of elbows. This can be an acute event associated with one of the two diagnoses above, or you can have a fracture. Chronically, Little Leaguer's elbow, described by Adams in 1964, is a medial humeral epicondyle fracture through the apophysis of the medial humeral epicondyle or the origin of the flexor pronator muscle mass. You can also have stress reaction and nerve instability, which could be a physiologic hypermobility of the ulnar nerve. Again, we're seeing more and more injuries of the UCL in young pitchers. Beware of that and do appropriate diagnostic tests, physical exam, rest, and MRI scans as indicated. What about laterally? We used to see a lot of osteochondritis to secans. The radial head is much more hard than the capitellum, so the repetitive forces of compression cause a OCD lesion of the capitellum. Don't see that as often in Japan. There are a lot of OCD lesions in their young throwers. You can also have a fracture of the capitellum, avulsion of the lateral humeral epicondyle, which is uh, more unusual, more common in gymnastics, for example. You can have subluxation of the radial head or a fracture of the capitellum radial head in the acute. Chronic lateral humeral epicondylitis, you can have radial head overgrowth with OCD lesions that are chronic, loose bodies, osteochondritis to secans, and there is uh, some conditions of osteochondritis of the radial head, but these are very unusual. Posteriorly, the osgood schlatters disease of the elbow is an overuse traction apophysitis of the olecranon that we see on a chronic basis. This is more common in throwers such as quarterbacks and pitchers, weightlifters, and they hurt directly over that olecranon apophysis. Chronically, you can also see spurs in the back in throwers, loose bodies, and posterior medial spurs. Acutely, olecranon fractures do occur. You can have soft tissue bursal contusions that can create swelling in that area. If they do have something going on with that olecranon apophysis, 
They hurt when you're resisting elbow extension and hurt directly on palpation over the olecranon apophysis where the triceps inserts. Anteriorly, we don't see as common in the um, elbow. Think about acute a distal physeal humerus fracture, capsular sprain in the hyperextended elbow, or loose bodies can hurt anteriorly associated with locking. Fortunately, in sports, we don't see supracondylar fractures. These are usually children climbing trees, if that happens anymore, or jumping out of trees, falling off of swing sets. There can be catastrophic problems following a displaced supracondylar humerus fracture, and this is neurovascular injury. The brachial artery median nerve are at risk, as you can see in this netter drawing where they are in the fracture site itself. Can develop compartment syndrome. There are some things that you never want to see, and that's one of these displaced fractures. They should be urgently transferred to a hospital preferably a pediatric facility with on-call pediatric orthopedic surgeons who can take care of this potentially very serious injury with neurovascular complications. So this is a displaced supracondylar humerus fracture. Refer to the center and get them in, a, in the hands of surgeons who feel comfortable dealing with this injury. What you never want to see in your career is a Volkmann's ischemic contracture, as shown in this picture. But once you see it, you'll never forget it. So you want to get these individuals in to be treated urgently at the proper facility and make a quick referral and contact that hospital, hopefully a children's hospital with a pediatric orthopedist on call. These supracondylar humerus fractures, in addition to the potential for Neurovascular complications, also you can have a malunion, you can have a cubitus varus. It's more cosmetic than functional. You can see this individual on the right has a gunstock deformity of his right arm where his arm is coming in. It will make him hit his thigh as he walks. Uh, cosmetically, it is oftentimes not acceptable to the family, and then an osteotomy of the humerus has to be done. So this shows the pinning that was done, and then his post-op, varus deformity. Elbow dislocations, think about this in an older child and an adolescent. You, the ones I just showed you were the distal humerus, a supracondylar fracture. So this is a transficeal fracture, but you have to also think about a displaced medial epicondyle fracture in the joint, as you can see in this individual. And again, you may not notice it on the dislocated film before the reduction, but get a post-op reduction film always, and sometimes you have to get the opposite side to try to better see where that medial humeral epicondyle is. This is a 14-year-old football athlete. He was going to get up after being on the field, and somebody landed on the back of his upper arm, creating a posterior elbow dislocation. Our thumb is in his olecranon fossa, so the ulna has gone posteriorly. This is what his x-ray looks like. So it looks like a posterior dislocation without a fracture, but if you notice, there could be something that is missing from this medial aspect, which you can't really tell unless you get a reduction film and get the opposite side. You can see a little better on this oblique. Sometimes it's hard to get the x-rays with the child uh, hurting or the adolescent hurting when they are dislocated, but get pre and post reduction x-rays. And there's the displaced medial epicondyle that was trapped in the joint. And always get post-reduction films. The ulnar collateral ligament attaches up into the axilla, if you will, of the medial aspect of the humerus and not actually on the medial humeral epicondyle. The olecranon apophysis, like we talked about, is where the triceps tendon attaches. So in the skeletally immature, when they're throwing, those tensile forces go more through the medial epicondyle, and hence you have an overgrowth of that medial humeral epicondyle. Technically, it's called an apophysis, where the origin of the flexor pronator muscle is. 
but always look at this medial aspect, as you can see up here, where the appearance of the medial humeral apophysis is from seven to nine years old, and the fusion varies from age 14 to 17. Again, a view of the opposite side is very helpful. This is that individual who had the elbow dislocation that I showed the films earlier. The ulnar nerve in this bottom right you can see is uh, fortunately was normal, but you can see how um, hemorrhagic it is. We made sure it was out of harm's way, didn't do any transposition, but carefully dissected out and put the medial humeral epicondyle back anatomically. You can see here how displaced it was, and this shows that medial humeral epicondyle. The complications after an elbow dislocation are stiffness, so you repair the capsule. Uh, you can put some sutures into the medial humeral epicondyle, but this epicondyle, or the ulnar collateral ligament, is again attaching more down in the humerus, and then after you put the, and then you put down the uh, uh, flexor pronator muscle origin with bone through a screw or two anatomically, as shown in this post-op x-ray. Medial humeral epicondyle, as mentioned, it's the origin of the flexor pronator muscle mass, the ulnar collateral ligament. The most important is the anterior oblique bands, like the ACL of the elbow, if you will, and it attaches in the medial epicondyle, coronoid, anterior, inferior, and not directly on the medial humeral epicondyle. This is, again, a view from the front showing the attachment on the humerus of the ulnar collateral ligament, which is right in here. Flexor pronator mass is higher up, so you usually see one or the other injury. Ulnar collateral ligament in the almost skeletally immature and in the younger thrower with wide open epiphyses and apophyses, you see little leaguer's elbow or a humeral medial epicondyle stress fracture, stress reaction. Lateral forces are tensile with the radial head compressing on the more soft uh, capitellum causing osteochondral injury, osteochondritis to secans. Medially are the tensile forces causing UCL injury and the more skeletally almost mature or medial epicondyle uh, injuries. So think about the nature of the forces and that'll help you make the right diagnosis. Distally, the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament attaches onto the a onto the sublime tubercle. This shows an avulsion of the sublime tubercle, which is very unusual, but you want to pick that up on your plane films. You can usually see it, and is also seen with bone edema and a bit of an avulsion fleck on an MRI scan. More commonly, the ulnar collateral ligament tears more proximal or mid-substance than distal and cannot be repaired. UCL reconstructions need to be done. Medial elbow pain, differential diagnosis in throwers. Younger individual is a medial epicondyle or apophyseal stress fracture. Older UCL tear, think about associated ulnar neuritis or hypermobility. Flexor pronator strain is much less common. You diagnose that with manual muscle testing, resistance of flexion of the elbow and pronation of the forearm. More, less commonly is a subluxating medial triceps. You can have valgus extension overload that's more common in an older thrower. And then a sublime tubercle fracture of the proximal ulna, which also is unusual but can be picked up on plain films and MR. There is some controversy about which medial epicondyle fractures to fix in that is there amount of displacement or is there some rotation? You can see in this individual on the left, this was a football quarterback, baseball pitcher, which is a common combination, and see how much of a gap there is there. So in this situation, because of this, the displacement of about five millimeters, and also you can see where it's a little bit rotated. So in addition to being off because the flexor pronator is pulling distally, sometimes there will be some rotation. So in throwers, there is concern that these may need to be fixed more often than not. So to fix or not to fix is not clear in the literature, but it is something that is dependent on the sport, amount of displacement, and perhaps some rotation due to the flexor pronator mass pulling on that apophysis. It's extra-articular, 
and the ulnar collateral ligament does not attach here. Ulnar collateral ligament attaches here, and in this individual, the UCL was completely normal and stable. This is a 12-year-old who had had elbow pain for four months, pitcher, quarterback. You can see his right elbow x-rays. See the displacement of the medial epicondyle from the medial humerus here. Doesn't really look too rotated. This patient and mother decided definitely not to have surgery done, which I agreed with. Keeping him from throwing was the, was the treatment. Didn't have to put him in a cast. He behaved, and if you can see the progression here, at one month in the middle, and then this is his opposite normal side, so this is a good way to explain to parents and patients why you're letting them, why you're not allowing them to throw, and then at three months, he's completely healed. So here's his normal opposite left side compared to his acute injury here on the right. Return to throwing without any residual problems, UCL was normal. This is a almost 13-year-old right-hand dominant pitcher. He stated that his elbow had been bothering him for about three weeks. Oftentimes it's longer than that. They don't pay attention to pain in that age group. He kept on throwing. Little League, now he's in the All-Stars. He's been in a rapid growth phase. He's 6'2", weighs 190 pounds, really doesn't have any instability. This was a case that I shared with my partner, Dr. Adam Smith, who took care of him. These are his initial x-rays, and this x-ray looks a little different than what I just showed with that displaced full medial apophysis. He has a little fleck off here, so and this was acute. Here's his normal side, so he does have a displaced medial epicondyle fracture, but it's not the whole epicondyle or the whole apophysis, and we had some concerns that did this really involve the ulnar collateral ligament? and his ulnar collateral ligament actually was normal. He stopped throwing. We let him move his elbow, but not do anything that created tension over the medial aspect of the elbow. So this is his minimally displaced fracture. And if you keep him from throwing, they will go ahead and heal. This is his x-ray. We x-rayed him every couple of weeks or month. This is his x-ray at two weeks, didn't show any change in, in displacement. This is at four weeks six weeks, and you can see here where it looks completely normal and healed at four months. He continued to grow. We worked on hip core strength on the opposite side, working on his rotator cuff. If you see this BB bullet appearance to a fracture of the inferior aspect of the medial epicondyle, it may heal if you don't allow them to pitch too early. It may take a long time to heal, but the ulnar collateral ligament is usually intact. This would be a situation where if you had any concerns about it, do a MRI scan. So the bottom line is like a BB gun, like a BB. Don't allow them to fire too soon with that throwing arm. It takes about six months before they should be back throwing. In the meantime, you can do sports-specific strengthening, getting them used to their new, new height and weight. This is an unfortunate situation where this 14-year-old pitcher had medial, epo, medial elbow pain for about a year, uh, and his apophysis, his medial, medial humeral epiphysis was still open, but you can see here on his stress views, he had an ulnar collateral ligament injury and a chronic avulsion there. So which comes first? This didn't heal, and with continued throwing, he had a UCL injury, so the UCL and this piece are pretty close together. His baseball career was ended, but he did have an elbow that he could use for everyday activity. The risk factors in these young throwers are overuse, fatigue, high pitch velocity, showcase participation. In studies from the American Sports Medicine Institute, Dr. Andrews and Fleissig, the problems were more related to the more months a year greater than eight months a year of throwing, five-fold increase in arm pain, shoulder and elbow injuries, greater than 80 pitches a game, four-fold, faster, greater than 85 miles per hour, 2.6 times greater injury of the shoulder and the elbow. Dr. Andrews is quoted as having said, the speed gun is the worst invention in the history of Little League Baseball. 
which I would agree with. Also, arm fatigue. Most of these young athletes, children with shoulder and elbow injuries that presented to the American Sports Medicine Institute for evaluation had arm fatigue. And if they had arm fatigue, they were 36 times greater risk of injury. UCL reconstructions, doing them more and more in younger individuals. This was 27 patients, 50% increase in UCL reconstruction in high school players by Dr. Andrews. And this is alarming. So these are preventable injuries. Let them play other positions and not pitch at too early an age with bad mechanics and during growth phases. There are programs. There's the STOP program that Dr. Andrews championed when he was the president of the American Orthopedic Sports Medicine Society. So STOP stands for Sports Trauma and Overuse Prevention. Participation in sports is great, but overuse is a problem. There are more injuries from overuse than acute injuries, such as falling off of something. And these potentially are career-changing if we don't appreciate them early, diagnose them early, and keep the children from hurting themselves. They don't feel pain. This is the .com, sport, StopSportsInjuries.com, and there's 16 sports that are up on this site. Refer your patients, children, kids to this site and let them figure out what their injuries are. Sometimes they're more attuned than their parents are. Textbook by Dr. Andrews, Any Given Monday. Dr. Andrews sees a lot of patients, and on that Monday clinic, he wrote this book and associated with Don Yeager, talking about sports injuries, prevention for athletes, parents, and coaches based on his experience. I would recommend this book as a good read for parents who have athletes and children who want or don't want to be athletes. So I think it's a really good read and a good resource for multiple sports in our youth. Prevention is key. Pritchers are at high risk. No speed guns, less showcases, do training other than baseball. Little league pitchers do not become big league pitchers. Remember that and tell that to the parents. That big pitcher syndrome that I showed, the 13-year-old, skeletally and mentally immature, they grow fast, poor pitching mechanics, have hip weakness, resulting in upper extremity overuse. We, the healthcare providers, should protect our young athletes and reduce this rate of rotator cuff and ulnar collateral ligament injuries in young pitchers. Preventable. Atlanta Braves did a study that was never published. Their Big League Atlanta Braves pitchers did not pitch in Little League, so I think you can use this to talk to parents about injuries and making sure that these injuries are treated with rest, avoiding those activities such as tensile forces medially and pitching for a period of time. Give them a game plan on how long it'll be, and Little League pitchers do not become Big League pitchers. Use that pitch, it works. Nolan Ryan didn't start pitching till he was a junior in high school. Never got hurt. What about shoulder injuries? In the adolescent, there are no good epidemiologic studies. There are trends toward acute dislocations in defensive players in football and extreme sports such as skateboarding, diving, other things such as winter sports now with snowboarding and other events that have become popular in the Olympics. Thinking about the contributions of the arm in that skeletal immature, contributions of individual growth. On the right, you can see the percentage of each bone. So in the humerus, what we see is 80% of the growth of the humerus occurs proximally, 20% at the elbow. When we think about the forearm, it's opposite. 80% of the growth occurs at the distal radius and 20% at the elbow. Thinking about the entire extremity, entire extremity, 80% occurs at the proximal humerus or the distal radius. So 40% proximal humerus, 40% distal radius, 
and then 10 distal humerus, 10 proximal forearm. They're not complications or problems for my short limb, but sometimes you do need to counsel the patients and family that x-rays need to be done and follow up to see the length of the limb. Appearance and closure of secondary ossification centers like the elbow, they're varied. It's important to know the males and the females. The appearance is here with the males in M and females in F, and then here are the closures. Again, a comparison view may be very helpful to determine any asymmetry one side compared to the other and help you find a fracture. Appearance and closure of the secondary ossification centers of the scapula, coracoid, acromion, clavicle. The last closure is of the medial clavicle at age 25. You can also see some apophyses in the coracoid. I've seen a few fractures of the coracoid through this apophysis. They heal, but you need to make the diagnosis and keep them out of contact sports. An osochromial is a non-fused os. Won't really be able to make that diagnosis until the early 20s when that should have fused. Usually asymptomatic. Seen best on an axillary lateral view or a striker view. This is a 16-year-old who had a medial epiphyseal fracture of his clavicle. He wasn't really dislocated his sternoclavicular joint, but you can see the prominences of the medial clavicle on the right. Significant structures that can be injured if there's a posterior dislocation or if we do surgery, it's very difficult to stabilize the saddle joint. Diagnosis is made by physical exam. You can get a plain x-ray. A CT scan gives us better information about appearance of that medial aspect of the clavicle. Hard to get a lateral view, plain view, because it's difficult to get rid of the head. And then this 3D shows this fracture. This is treated with symptomatic, with a figure of eight if they would like that, sleeping with a pillow behind their scapula. And here he is one year post-op. He never went back to football. He does have this cosmetic deformity, but no functional problems. Little leaguer's shoulder, by definition, is a proximal humerus stress fracture. The patients present with diffuse shoulder pain Usually it's reproducible when trying to do a throwing movement, such as with external rotation, and they hurt in the proximal humerus, oftentimes more posterior lateral, and with external rotation. They may not be weak in their rotator cuff. Radiographs are done. Comparison striker views usually show asymmetry, and you can make this diagnosis with plain films. Typically don't need an MRI scan. This is an example on the bottom of Little Leaguer's shoulder. You can see on the right shoulder, on the left-hand side, there is a greater distance here, greater radiolucency from the humeral epiphysis to the metaphysis. So this is a Salter I fracture of the proximal humerus. And you can see the opposite side. So when you're making this diagnosis, it's oftentimes good to get a picture of the opposite side. That gets the parents and the individual to know it's going to take a while for this to heal, and they just can't throw. If they're really symptomatic, you can put them in a sling, but usually they're not that symptomatic when you stop external rotation forces such as in throwing. The epiphysis usually has a little bit more of a line here laterally, so that's normal on this side. And you can see how the bone is already starting to heal. We see this in gymnasts, the distal radius, where the distal radius has extra compression forces, and this may cause a arrest of the distal radius and a relative overgrowth of the ulna. So be aware of that and get plain films if there is distal radius wrist pain in a gymnast and somebody that's doing repetitive axial loading. Little leaguer shoulder in this series by Bill Carson. There were 23 patients in the Florida area. Average age was 14. 19 of the 23 were pitchers. They had pain while throwing. Usually they had pain for about seven months before they were seen. 
In the treatment, this will heal as long as you don't allow them to throw. Usually it heals in about three months. The follow-up was 10 months, and most of these individuals return to baseball. Typically it's pitchers. There could be some rotation at that epiphysis that accounts for the increased external rotation in the dominant hand of pitchers that we see in pitchers who have started pitching when they were skeletally mature. So there could be a skiffy type rotation of the humeral epiphysis on the diaphysis accounting for bony adaptation and what we see with the skeletally mature pitcher. This physeal and range of motion changes in a study by Scott Mayer and Tim Uhl from the University of Kentucky. There were 79 youth baseball players ages 8 to 15 and there was increased physeal width on the dominant side and also increased external rotation on the dominant side. There were some CT scans that were done to confirm an asymmetry in that proximal humeral epiphysis consistent with some rotatory abnormality with the way that the little ear's elbow, little ear shoulder healed. This is a biomechanics magazine that uh, also talks about rotational adaptation and humeral head external rotation or retroversion that occurs in throwing athletes. This is a 15-year-old baseball outfielder. He just threw the ball from the outfield, felt acute pain in his arm. It was like his arm followed the ball to the plate. And you can see his diaphyseal fracture the initial x-ray is on the left, and you can see a little suggestion of maybe there is more lucency here. So if you see this injury with very little trauma other than throwing, think about an underlying pathologic fracture, and in this individual, it was a simple cyst. It can be a little hard if you see them when they already have um, a sugar tongue on or plaster. So this is at six weeks. And then this is at two and a half months, so it will heal. It might heal more predictably after a fracture occurs. So this is a pathologic fracture through a simple cyst of the diaphysis. You can see here where at two and a half months it's filling in. This was a 12 and a half year old who broke her left wrist. And she was told not to do crazy things, but she went and did some log dancing in a uh, river and fell and broke her opposite humerus. So she has a right humerus fracture. And in her, it's a little hard to see the cyst, but she fell onto the bank and um, didn't do anything bad to her opposite wrist fracture, but she was probably a little off balance. And she has a fracture through a simple cyst of her humerus. And you can see it's a little more concerning in her situation. She wants to get back to play soccer, and she still does have a pretty significant cyst here. And at 18 months, she's totally asymptomatic, playing full sports, uh, not doing heavy lifting like bench press or a um, axial loading sport such as gymnastics. Um, but she goes ahead and uh, heals this. This is at three years. I got an x-ray when I saw her for another orthopedic problem. So think about a simple cyst if there is not a lot of trauma and a fracture of the humerus diaphyseal. Remember to examine the scapula. Have the patient reproduce their symptoms. They may come in with shoulder pain, and you need to get the females in a sports bra or a tank top, and the males examine them without their shirt on because you may think it's a shoulder problem, and it is not a rotator cuff or a glenohumeral problem, but it is more of a scapular problem. If the scapula is unstable, shoulder problems will result. And an unstable scapula is similar to firing a cannon out of a canoe. It just doesn't work well, not effective. The cannonball doesn't go far. Scapular dysfunction. Remember the scapula. You can have tightness anterior of the shoulder. The head can be forward. You can have overdeveloped pectoralis. This all affects the scapula. The scapula may have been abnormal to start off with. What we do to try to improve scapular position is the command of putting their elbows in their back pocket, touching the medial borders of the scapula, doing shrugs. Think of the scapula as a clock face, moving counterclockwise and clockwise. A lot of different muscles act around the scapula. 
the protractors and retractors. Typically what happens when there is scapular dysfunction is the scapula moves in a protracted way and upward. This happens because the glenoid, which is the socket of our shoulder, is also uh, connected obviously to the humerus. And so there are adaptations that most likely come after the shoulder injury where the scapula typically moves up and in a protracted. So it goes upward and then protracts. And that's probably a result of a rotator cuff problem or an instability problem, an adaptation trying to get the glenoid in a little better position. So when you have somebody abduct their, their arms, sometimes you may think that glenohumeral uh, movement is normal, but it, a lot of it may be at the scapulothoracic articulation. So a lot of different muscles here, rhomboids, serratus, latissimus, causing the movement of the scapula. This is an individual who was doing 20 pound single leg dumbbells, doing forward punches, abduction, and if you look at his right scapula, there is asymmetry where there is a holler or concavity over the area where his supraspinatus and infraspinatus are. He comes in with shoulder pain. If we hadn't taken his shirt off and examined his scapula, we probably would have made the diagnosis of rotator cuff strain, but that didn't really make sense. So see the asymmetry that he's got? He's really pretty strong in his super and infraspinatus, but when we do rotation, you can see the scapula moving, like we talked about more in a protracted upward position. He can do dips, but there's a definite asymmetry where there is not the normal muscularity here indicating a neurologic injury. So he had a brachial plexus stretch of a C5 injury from up in his neck causing atrophy here of his muscle. It wasn't a rotator cuff tear. It was atrophy because of a stretch of the C5 musculature which innervates the supra and infraspinatus. Relative rest work for him. This is a golfer, right-handed, who was having left shoulder pain. He had had a slap repair done five years before of his left shoulder. The thought was maybe he had had a new injury to his labrum. And when we asked him to do his golf move, which caused him to have pain, you can see the asymmetry of his scapula. See how it wings? But he doesn't have that atrophy as in that last individual that had the C5 radiculopathy and ask him to do the activity. He doesn't have a golf club, but you can see here where there's asymmetry of his scapula, which is primary problem. Oftentimes that's compensatory for a shoulder problem. And when you do hands on the waist and push back, there's not a difference, but when he does his golf um, pretending to hit, there's a definite difference. Scapular retraining worked for him, and he really didn't have a primary glenohumeral joint problem. Oftentimes the scapula again occurs secondary to a shoulder problem, but remember the scapula and always examine it. Again, it's like firing a cannon out of a canoe. If your scapula is unstable, you're not going to be able to get that cannonball too far. This is a 20-year-old left-hand dominant individual, had two true scapular winging, if you will, because of a solid mass. He has multiple osteochondromatosis and did have a scapula osteochondroma. His girlfriend had noticed this when there was an asymmetry in his scapula. X-rays clearly show this osteochondroma because it was central in this area. There was concern that it could have a malignant degeneration, so uh, excision of this was done. So get an x-ray, look at the x-ray, look at the scapula. This is a good um, scapular Y view that well shows this mass. Fortunately it was benign. And this axillary lateral view, which is a great view, coracoid is anterior. So here's the glenoid, here's the coracoid, and in the back is this mass. CT scan is helpful in these cases and this showed a mass that had been there for quite some time. Sometimes it's hard to see your scapula and see what's going on with it, so it's 
Always good to have someone look to see if there's symmetry to the scapula. Now when we think about the older individuals, we have to think about a cervical disc herniation as causing arm shoulder pain. Oftentimes this is night pain. It's excruciating. It's more nerve pain. So in the older individual, without a specific mechanism of injury that comes in not wanting to move anything, think about a herniated disc. The diagram here shows C5-6 herniation, C6-7 herniation. These are the most common levels of herniation. And then certainly they can have pain from different discs, different radiculopathy in different areas of the cervical spine, but it is important to uh, do a good sensory exam and know where your nerve sensory dermatomes are, do a good sensory and motor exam, get an x-ray, plain x-ray of the cervical spine, as well as consider an MRI scan and refer them appropriately. There are a lot older patients in our population. The burden of musculoskeletal disease in the U.S., this is a publication about the prevalence in societal and economic costs. This was created by our, our American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons in 2011. There'll be updates. There are more and more total shoulder arthroplasties and reverse shoulder arthroplasties being done in our population. We're living longer. We're driving our shoulders harder, having chronic rotator cuff tears. So in this publication, The Burden of Musculoskeletal Diseases, you can see here where the primary shoulder and shoulder revisions are only 3%. So a lot more hips and knees being done, more total knees than anything, but you can see the alarming statistics of revisions. So we're seeing a lot, lot more revisions and we don't have a whole lot of options in revising a reverse total shoulder. So you'll hear more and more about that in our older population. Replacement surgery. This was quality measures from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. You can look some of these up on the internet. Knees, 600,000, half as many hips, and then only 53,000 shoulders, so 7% of all joints done. Counseling patients and education, there are a lot of dot coms. It's important that you provide your patients with excellent referrals to patients, to surgeons that do a fair number of shoulder arthroplasties. There are more hits for lawyers.com, unfortunately, than doctors.com. Uh, they're total joint companies. Let me start with that one again. <clears throat> Ready? It's important to counsel our patients on what total shoulder arthroplasty and reverse arthroplasties are. This can be done with WebMD, with other dot coms. It's a lot of surgery to go through for a total joint. Make sure that your referrals to the orthopedic surgeon are ones that do enough of these and treat their patients as they would want their families or friends to be treated. There are a lot of Opportunities for lawyers.com as well as doctors.com. Internet search, osteoarthritis, 12.8 million. Knee arthritis, 8.9 million. Hip, 3.3 million. Supplements, 50 million. So the number of total knee replacements done in these internet search, 3.37 million. Total shoulder, 27.4 million. So again, only like 8% shoulder replacements compared to knees, but... It's um, increasing in frequency, and you may make sure the indications are correct and that your patients are ready for replacement surgery before they have it done. In the mid-'80s, we used staples for stabilization for surgery. This was a staple that was developed by a pioneer in arthroscopic surgery, it was a staple to put the labrum back. Unfortunately, staples and the shoulder, metal around the shoulder doesn't mix very well, so this caused erosion of the humeral head and significant problems, rapid osteoarthritis of the, of the shoulder. So fortunately now we're better with what um, 
devices we use around the shoulder. Rarely do we use metal. We have better sutures, better arthroscopic devices, but beware metal about the shoulder and beware new things that we do with the shoulders because there can be some complications. This is a 35-year-old who developed uh, chondrolysis following a pain pump that was used in his shoulder after he had stabilization. You can see the metal anchors, which aren't the problem, but three months after he had uh, dissolved articular cartilage, probably because of the pH of the pain pump, and you can see the spurs that were down here inferior on his humeral head. This is courtesy of David Abbasi and John Badalak, Jeremy Stern, chondrolysis. This was in ortho bullets. You can see the devastating problem here where basically this young individual needs a total shoulder replacement. So there are potential complications. It can be bad with any surgery. We don't use the pain pumps anymore, and hopefully we won't see these devastating chondrolytic problems anymore. Who gets glenohumeral osteoarthritis? Weightlifters, people doing performance-enhancing drug, males more common than females, use of upper extremity devices for weight bearing, such as if they had a baloney amputation using crutches, they end up using their shoulders as weight bearing joints and they wear them out. This is a weightlifter. You can see his loss of rotation range of motion on the left shoulder. His x-rays looked like this. You can see the significant osteophyte in the lower left, which is from his humeral head. And basically, this was early on. We did a CT scan, see a lot of the osteophytes. Previously, many years ago, we went in and tried to scope these patients. Very difficult because they have a stiff joint. Take the spurs off, but it doesn't work. It doesn't really help. Non-operative treatment of glenohumeral osteoarthritis is supportive, non steroidal anti-inflammatory medicine, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate. Physical therapy doesn't really help. Uh, you can attempt to improve neck position, scapular position, which are altered because of the limited motion and pain. What are the surgical treatments? Arthroscopy doesn't really work. You can do a hemiarthroplasty, replacing the proximal humerus, a total shoulder, a reverse where the glenoid is actually low and the ball is high, biologic resurfacing, or a fusion. Just wanted to show you some of the options here. Arthroscopy is the gold standard for detecting chondral injuries in young patients, but if they continue with the weightlifting, there is continued problem and deterioration of their joint. This is from the American Journal of Sports Medicine showing an algorithm for decision-making approach to uh, patient-based and disease-based factors, and that's what we need in these young active individuals. Not a lot of good choices. This is a 70-year-old, as you can see, has significant glenohumeral osteoarthritis, non-dominant shoulder, limited range of motion, deformity of her humeral head, proximal migration of the humerus, candidate for shoulder arthroplasty. The replacement options, if you have a huge rotator cuff tear, a reverse needs to be done. This shows a shoulder joint replacement. Typically, it is the metal ball, the proximal humerus, with a stem. If you replace the glenoid side, this is what that plastic socket looks like. And this is from the AOS Ortho Info. So this is an x-ray of a total shoulder replacement. So um, humeral head is replaced and a plastic glenoid. This shows the caplite hemiarthroplasty, a resurfacing. And then on the right is this reverse. You have to have a functioning deltoid. It's in cases where the cuff is not repairable and they have osteoarthritis. These are being done more and more. Started being done about 15 years ago in Europe, more and more here in our country over the last five years. Make sure the patient is ready for this. There's not a lot of good bailout after a reverse shoulder replacement failure. So again, the ball part is proximal, so that's why it's called reverse. And the socket is distal, so to speak. The deltoid has to be working but it's in a massive rotator cuff tear with osteoarthritis as the indication. Which is safer, organized sport or free play? I'll leave that up to you, but I really think organized sports cause more long-term problems than free play. Both bone and forearm fractures are easily treatable, concerning when they happen, but it's much harder and longer impact and not 
being able to get back to full activities after UCL reconstruction. These individuals oftentimes are invincible, as this young man who on a skateboard broke one, both bone forearm, and then he went back on his skateboard and broke the other one. Not going to get hurt. You can tell that in his face, but he does. Adults are obsolete children, Dr. Seuss. So in this presentation from our young athletes to our older athletes, I've tried to show you what things to use to make the correct diagnosis. In our older golden sneaker athletes, you need to make sure they have a realistic expectation of their shoulder arthroplasty and make sure that you've gone through all other options before uh, referring them for arthroplasty surgery. Thank you very much.